guys, Mrs. Stratton here. Today I'm going to be reading Chapter 2 of Restart by Gordon Corman, read with permission from Scholastic Publishers. Chapter 2, Shoshana Weber. Shosh 466. Hey, little bro, want to smile? JW Piana Man. Question mark, question mark, question mark? Shosh 466. Alpha Rat took a header off his roof and almost killed himself. JW Piano Man. By almost, you mean Shosh 466. Sorry, still alive, but supposedly messed up. Just got out of the hospital yesterday. JW Piano Man. Any chance Beta and Gamma Rats fell with him? Shosh 466. Nope, solo performance. Don't get greedy. Smiling yet? JW Piano Man. Now who's being greedy? I exit messages and call Joel because I'm worried about him. I always worry about him. He's my younger brother. 14 minutes younger anyway. But if the thought of Chase Ambrose falling off his stupid roof onto his stupid head doesn't bring a smile to Joel's lips, then something is seriously wrong. Besides the usual, I mean. Hey, he answers. Even in that single syllable, I can pick up the discouraged tone in his voice. He's angry and homesick, and who can blame him? It's not like going away to boarding school was his first choice, or even his 20th. Is Melton getting any better? I ask, almost afraid to hear the answer. That's Melton Prep and Musical Conservatory in New Britain, Connecticut. What can I tell you? It's exile. I don't argue with him. How can I? Joel's a talented musician who belongs in a place like Melton, but that doesn't change the fact that he'd still be at home starting 8th grade at Hawassi if it weren't for what happened. How are the other kids? Okay, he replies without much enthusiasm. All losers, just like me. I'm probably not going to get picked on, if that's what you mean. There are no pickers here, only pickies. That bugs me. You're not losers. You're there because you're winners. You have talent. There's a reason why I can't live in my own town, and it has nothing to do with playing the piano. It's Alpharat, and you know it. If he fell off a skyscraper instead of his own roof, I'd be on my way home right now. I'd have to let that pass, because it's the bitter truth. Chase Ambrose and his two disgusting friends hounded my poor brother out of town. The thought of it amazes me, even though I saw it happen. I still can't figure it out. Chase isn't Darth Vader or Voldemort. He doesn't have the force or dark magical powers. And yet he, Aaron Heikeman, and Br'er Bratsky made Joel's life so miserable that my parents had no choice but to find him a school in another town. We tried to fight it. My dad spent so much time in the principal's office that it would have made sense for him to leave a change of clothes there. But nothing could be done about the bullying. Most of the time, there was no way to prove it was doing it. A random foot tripping Joel in the crowded hall. A shoulder rammed into his chest that sent him sprawling. Sorry, man, didn't see you. Dog poop pushed in through the vents of his locker. His clothes mysteriously disappearing from the changing room to be replaced by a rabbit suit. When a science project wound up smashed or a painting ruined in the art room, it was always Joel's. On the night of the talent show, when the fire alarm was pulled, it was during Joel's piano performance. It started with just Chase, Aaron, and Bear. Eventually, though, it spread. The other kids, well, they couldn't help but notice that every time someone was making a fuss or protesting, stuffed into a locker or mummified with toilet paper, it was my brother. Before you knew it, Joel was the school victim and the school joke. His life was practically unbearable. Who do you blame? The principal? Dr. Fitzwallis did what he could, but most of the time there wasn't any evidence. Sure, he could make the occasional try. There was the time Chase chucked a lacrosse stick at Joel's bike and the butt end got jammed in the spokes. Joel went flying over the handlebars and wound up with a sprained wrist, a black eye, and a nasty scrape along his jaw stretching from chin to ear. There are plenty of witnesses to that one. Dr. Fitzwallis was all set to throw the books at Chase, a long suspension, the works. The school board overruled him. They agreed it was wrong to throw the stick, but insisted that Chase couldn't have predicted it would result in a serious injury. Ha! The real reason was that Chase was the town's sports hero, and the son of the last town sports hero. Chase's dad had a lot of admirers on that board, and my family didn't. The only time anyone was able to pin something on those three idiots, it had less to do with my poor brother than the fact it cost the district money. At the big open house in May, 
Joel is invited to play the piano. He's by far the best musician around here, even if none of the other kids appreciate it. Anyway, Chase, Aaron, and Bear planted six cherry bombs inside the school's baby grand. Time for the middle of the performance. I can still hear Joel's screams when the fire cr- when the big firecrackers went off, splintering the wood of the piano. I think that's the part of it that makes him such an irresistible target for the chases of the world. They know they can always get a reaction out of him. After that, Joel couldn't even walk down the hall without a bunch of football players making fun of how scared he was. We were all scared, but it's only Joel they remember. The irony is that the case against Chase and company had nothing to do with the attack on my brother. No, it was the damage to the piano that got the administration upset enough to call the police. The juvenile court sentenced Chase, Aaron, and Bear to community service at our town's senior citizen's home, as if the elderly deserved that. You'd think Chase would leave Joel alone after that. It would have made sense, but sense has never been an alpha rat quality. So my parents found a new place for Joel, because as long as that bully was around, my brother would never be safe. Joel's probably right that if Chase had fallen off a skyscraper instead of just a roof, he'd be able to leave Belton and come home. Sometimes I feel like I should be up on that tall building, pushing Chase over the side, but that would make me no better than him. And I am better. Everybody is. The night before the first day of school, my dad always used to take Joel and me to Heaven on Ice, which is one of those self-serve frozen yogurt places. Even though Joel and I are twins, our dessert strategies are totally opposite. I get vanilla yogurt with just a handful of chocolate sprinkles. Joel prefers a thimbleful of yogurt and 99% toppings. It's a competition to see who can load up the most weight. I don't want to go this year. Come on, Shosh, my dad wheedles. It's a tradition. All your friends will be there. Not my best friend. He gives me a sad smile. So you and Joel are best friends now? When he's home, you two fight like cats and dogs. He should be home now. I know dad's trying to help, but I'm determined to be miserable. We've been over this a million times. This is the best thing for Joel. Whatever the reason, he's there. He'll learn to love Melton for the music program. In the end, I let him talk me into going. Mom and dad are worried enough about my brother. I don't need them stressing over me too. It's weird to be at Heaven on Ice without Joel. I see Hugo and Marcia. The first question they ask is how Joel's doing. The way they see it, it's like he's been shipped off to the moon, not Connecticut. I don't want to deal with the whole sob story again, so I changed the subject and asked them about camp. They both went to sleep away this summer. Right when Hugo is telling me about his life and death struggle with a pup tent, I spot him. The jerk. The worst person in the world. Chase has a few small cuts and bruises on his face, almost like nothing what I was hoping for. His left arm is in a sling, but that's about it. He's standing in front of the row of yogurt dispensers with a timid look on his face like he honestly can't decide what flavor he wants. Isn't that classic? The kid who feasted on Joel, chewed him up and spit him out. Can't make him his mind between strawberry banana and rum raisin. Too bad they don't have poison. He must feel me glaring at him because he glances up and catches my eye. He looks right through me at first, which is insulting enough. And then he does something so horrible that I can barely believe it, even from the likes of him. He casts me a shy smile. All the anger that's been building inside me since Joel left for Melton rises to the surface like magma. Before I have a chance to think about it and stop myself, I stalk over to Chase. I get right in his face and tell him, You've got some nerve grinning at me after what you did. You stay out of my way or you'll be sorry. I take my beautiful vanilla yogurt with chocolate sprinkles, dump it over his head, and sweep out of the store. My father's in conversation with one of the other dads and almost misses me storming past. Done so soon, he asks. Then he looks back inside and sees our family's arch enemy dripping frozen yogurt and sprinkles all down his face, dabbing at himself with a soaked napkin in his one free hand. Cars are on the corner, dad mumbles, hurrying me away from heaven on ice. He's embarrassed, sure, but maybe also a little proud. And how do I feel? I thought there was nothing Chase could do to make me madder at him than I already am. I stand corrected. Every time I think about it, my blood boils a little hotter. 
After all the bad history that went down between him and Joel, I swear he looked at me like he'd never seen me before in his life, like he hadn't played a starring role in destroying my family.